to the Bumblecast. I'm your host, Ian Flynn, the Bumble King, and joining me is the voice of the Bumblecast, the guiding light, the pillar of this entire show, Kyle JCRB Krause. Every time I hear guiding light, I just think of the old soap opera that I don't think is around anymore. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I mean, uh... I don't know. <laughs> what the I, difference being, I'm the one who hasn't been around, but you are. You have been. You've kept the show going. So thank you again for that, dear sir. Yeah, well, of course. I I wouldn't want to not do this show, even though doing it without you is a little weird, I will admit, because <laughs> it's, it's the Bumblecast. It's literally the Bumble King podcast, and the Bumble King is not here. What am I supposed to do about that? <laughs> You you have managed remarkably well. Uh, I guess to that end, to update folks on what's going on, it's like, oh, Ian sounds like Ian again. What's up with that? Uh, so Aaliyah did a little bit of research, and my doctor verified this. Apparently, the steroids used in some inhalers, when used by some people, cause momentary vocal cord damage. Oh, so the way I get around this is I don't take my medicine. Well, um, okay. <laughs> uh, I thought the inhalers were for you to take. They are. So uh, for, I might be getting a little breathy by the end of the episode. For, for your, for your, I, 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 so that's weird. That's very weird. Um, I'm confused. I mean, y'all, the the directions already said, you know, wash your mouth out so that it doesn't cause a fungal infection to grow in your mouth. Correct. And so I've been doing that, but uh, now I gargle very hardcore and I skip doses where I can so I can, you know, maintain human contact. So this is what I do for you, dear listeners. I put myself on the line and then after this, I'm probably going to be sucking back sweet sweet condensed medicine air oh boy okay well that is weird (laughs) it's that kind of year isn't it sure yeah something (laughs) like that (laughs) how about you sir how are you doing i'm holding up pretty well you know we're we're here we're we're hanging out except we're not going out so don't don't go out (laughs) <laughs> like literally please don't go out or i guess do but do it responsibly but yeah i mean that's really all i can say i not much going on here otherwise i've been streaming uh a bit lately trying to play through bayonetta finally because it's i've had it sitting on my shelf for years and then i've had it sitting in my steam library for more years so i'm like okay fine I'll freaking play through it. So I'm working my way through that on the stream. So if you haven't been keeping up, twitch.tv slash BumblecastGaming. That's where I'm playing through everything. So uh, after that, I don't know what I'm going to play exactly. I don't know if I'm going to play Doom 64 or something else. I don't know. We'll see. Well, the only way to find out what Kyle is playing is to, of course, check out the YouTube channel or check us out at twitch.tv backslash BumblecastGaming. But... Until then, we have a special guest for the show. You know her as a mainstay of the Sonic comics and as a contributing writer to the Sonic Boom TV series. She will be the new main writer for the Sonic IDW series once the Metal Virus Saga is completed. Please welcome the one, the only, the multi-talented Evan Stanley. (laughs) Hi. Hello, Evan. Welcome to the show. Yes, welcome. Yeah. It is uh, good to have you here. Maybe for the folks who uh, aren't sure who you are, even though Ian just did a glorious introduction for you, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got into Sonic. Sure. Um, well, I'm. I, I, let's see. I got into Sonic around like 2006-ish. Um and it wasn't actually me. It was my brother who really got into, 
uh, Sonic cartoons on like Newgrounds, and he's like, "This is awesome! I love this!" And he bought, he went out and he bought a Genesis, and uh, he played like Sonic Two for like an hour. He's like, "I don't love this. It sucks." <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, so he just kind of abandoned it. I'm like, oh, look, video games. I've never done this before. And I played it for an hour and I was like, this sucks. And I put it down. (laughs) My heart. (laughs) heart. Uh, uh, It's okay. I've revised my opinion on that. Um, (laughs) Okay, good. (laughs) So, and that, but. so then he started showing me the cartoons he'd found online and I ended up uh, stumbling onto the uh, uh, Summer of Sonic website because it was 2006. It was the anniversary and stuff. And there was that wet fan site that was basically a portal for a ton of fan work. And I just went spent a whole summer deep dive it, into that. And I was completely hooked. And after that, I went and played all the games and uh, write all the fan comics I could find, all that stuff. Um, let's see. When did I? Oh, and I, uh, I tried to read the comics. I picked up an issue, was terrified, and put it back down for two years. <laughs> <laughs> it was the it was the issue where uh, Sir Connery dies. Oh wow! And I was just like, "This is this is I don't know what's going on, and it's frightening." That's Um, not the best jumping on (laughs) issue. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What the one that got me hooked was the uh, the first free comic book day issue that you wrote, Ian. That was like a perfect starter issue. Yeah, that that was you know tailor made to hook the young ones. That's the, that, that's the whole point of those. Yes, <laughs> that was that was so funny. I was like, "Oh, this is great! I love Not Hole. I bet it'll be around for a really long time." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's how I got into it. And uh, since I've always been into like drawing and stuff, uh, doing a fan comic was the best way for me to like contribute and be part of the community. So. I went and I found out I love making comics. So that one thing has led to another and now I'm here. I never stopped and now it's my job. <laughs> and speaking of, thank you for that beautiful segue. <laughs> what was your very first professional Sonic gig? When did you finally make the leap from aspiring fan to holy crap, they're paying me for this? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was actually kind of an accident. Um, so I've been making my fan comic, Ghost of Future, for maybe like four years, I think, at that point. And I was I had gotten super into the comics. And um, they were holding a fan art contest. I think it was called like Sonic Versus. And you had to draw Sonic fighting one of the villains. And so I did a like this big fancy painting of uh, Super Sonic versus Super Scourge. And uh, I turned it in, and I, I really enjoyed it. It was fun to make. I'm glad I did. And then uh, I didn't expect to win, and so I just kind of turned it in. I'm like, okay, that was fun, and I forgot about it for a few months. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then I got an email, and like you know, like the results for the contest came out. I'm like, okay, I didn't win. That's cool. Uh, but I got an email from the editor at the time. Paul Kaminsky, and he's like, hey, I saw your entry. Would you like to do some freelance work for us? I'm like, oh, <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> um, I actually I actually had to, like, st- whenever I get something I get really excited about, I have to get up and, like, run around. So I was actually running, I had to, like, run around my house for five minutes before I could go answer the email. <laughs> um, So, yeah, and it turns out later he told me that that whole contest was actually a stealth recruiting technique on his part. So, yeah, it sounds like Paul. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, so and yeah, apparently, even though my art was super wonky at the time, uh, I kept going and got tighter and uh, I kept doing small jobs for quite a while. But I kept getting those jobs and slowly. Paul and then Vincent increased my workload until I was working almost full time. Do you remember what your first like 
Oh, was- right, right. It was the frontispiece. Um, uh, it's a picture of Nagus and Jeffrey, and like Nagus is like standing over him and all spooky. I think it got used in a free comic book day issue as like a bonus pinup. And then my first issue, my first story was right after the first Genesis wave. Um, it's the five page backup where Nagus got his backstory like, like refreshed. Okay. Yeah. Jeez, it's been so long. Yeah. <laughs> that that was a while ago. Yeah. Whew. Yeah, um, I did a lot of I did a lot of backs. Yeah, that, and then the one with um, Elias and uh, the Owl Frig Harvey. Who? Yeah, yeah. those oh, are my first yeah. two jobs. I love the new <laughs> design you gave Harvey. I d- I designed that in math class. <laughs> I was not taking notes. I was designing Harvey Who, and then my boyfriend, who was in class with me, was like, "What if he had a mustache?" You just came over and drew one on there. I'm like, Fuck, "It looks good." <laughs> the Who with the Who Manchu. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, what do you What do you think uh, you find most? Like a challenging. What is the most challenging aspect of uh, working on Sonic? The most challenging aspect. Um, I don't know if this, it's not really a specifically Sonic thing, but the most challenging thing for me is kind of time management. Not the way like it's hard for me to focus and get my work done. It's hard for me to stop and make time for myself mm. in my day because I will happily work. 12 to 16 hours almost nonstop. And uh, it's great until it's really, really not great. <laughs> yeah. That, that's probably the, the real practical, like hardest thing. The next hardest thing is just um, the precision involved because I went on the official comics. You have to really stick to the models. And with my style, because it's very close to the official style, I get no wiggle room. But at that point, at this point, I'm used to that. So it's not like that big of a deal. Right. And when you, when a script comes in, it's like, okay, I need to draw this. What is something that you find that you just really enjoy? Like when the script comes in, it's like, Oh, I get to draw this goody, goody, goody. Uh, well, for me, it's the real, it's actually just quiet, emotional dialogue scenes are where I feel like I can do my best work. Um, where it's really all about the character performance and kind of using the staging to reflect the power balance in the conversation. Mm-hmm. That's that's what I think I do best, and I really enjoy those scenes. Um, I'd say that's my favorite because that's what I. That's the most common thing that I like that I get the most. But the oh yes, the ultimate is when you throw just like suddenly we've switched to a horror comic for whatever <laughs> reason. If I have to draw something absolutely horrifying, I am there. So much fun. I'm sorry you've been starved for that kind of content in this recent run. Oh, so but there, there is that one there is that one bit where um uh Neo Metal Sonic um he starts transforming and he like puts his head down and he's like you can't see his face and he pops back up and he's like halfway a dragon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like that was like <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was awesome, yes. Kind of uh transitioning over to uh what you're going to be working on here pretty soon or what you probably actually already are working on but you know <laughs> the folks haven't seen it yet um what has been your general apo- approach to uh the post metal virus world in the sonic comics now well my main approach is mm, smaller more self-contained stories that are kind of working with the world that's already set up and just digging a little bit deeper into what's set up because it's like, there's no need right now for big changes. What we need right now is just like enjoying the world that we have because there's this whole, everything was all set up and ready to go, but hasn't gotten a chance to really feel lived in yet. So 
small stories that feel very grounded in specifically the IDW setting and can only work there to really make the comic feel like its own special thing. So doing kind of more world building stuff. Yeah. To uh, yeah, to flesh things out a bit. Now that the mm-hmm. now that the whole uh world ending metal virus saga is, you know, coming to an end at least. <laughs> Finally have a little bit more time to uh maybe delve into some of the finer aspects of the uh, yeah. <laughs> of the IDW Sonic world. Yeah, and, and all these characters just need a break. Yeah, really. <laughs> they, 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 tr- they truly do after after what Ian's put them through. Like the the huge arcs are great, but it's like oh, I feel bad for everyone. <laughs> it, it's been an endurance race for sure, mm. on for the readers and the characters, and actually, <laughs> you know, we're getting towards the end of it. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to start thinking about what to do for 2020 uh, or 2021. What do I do for an encore? <laughs> and David, the editor, emails me and says, okay, so. We're going to shake things up a little bit. We're going to try Evan out on the lead series for a while, and we want you to do more backup side stuff. I'm like, ha, 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 ha. I don't have to think about how to follow it up. It's all on <laughs> Evan's shoulders. Oh, My uh, problem now. Uh oh. <laughs> Here, let me pass you that buck. <laughs> and. I've seen what Evan has planned, and I am biting my lips super hard because it's it's fun stuff. Oh, She's let's got see, I lined up. I'm good at twisting the emotional knife. I just do it in a sneakier way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want more tangle and whisper. Can can we get that at least? <laughs> I don't know what I'm allowed to say. <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> can you think of anything that you can tease? Because I can't. I'm not subtle enough. Yeah, I can't. I don't know. I don't know. It, 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 it's a, you know, it, it just depends on uh, who's listening. Who's listening to this show? Oh, <laughs> <God>. <laughs> Well, I well, mean, yeah. I, I, I'm actually, I, I do kind of want to go off script here a little bit. Um, just since you did get into Sonic a lot later than uh, Ian and I did, a bit more recently, mm-hmm. I should say. Yeah. Um, how? What was your um, following, like your your uh, exposure to Sonic Two? <laughs> and the fact that you didn't really, <laughs> you didn't really much care for it initially. Uh, what was, what was your experience with Sonic following that? As far as like, what games have you have you enjoyed? Um, okay, stuff yeah. like that. So, uh, the so the first thing I had was the Genesis. It's funny because I started late, but my per- I decided to kind of mostly play the games in chronological order from what I could pick up. Right. So I got a similar kind of sense for how things have evolved. So I started with the Genesis. Um, I didn't really mesh with Sonic one and two. Um, uh, I didn't play games at all until I was like 13, 12, 13 years old. Um, So I didn't have a lot of skill. So those games are a little bit harder to start off with. So I kind of hit the wall and I wasn't having fun with them, but I got Sonic three and I don't know why, but that just game just clicked something about it works for me. And so Sonic three and Sonic three and knuckles, um, that was my game. And I have played that more times than I can count. I've, done all the things i've mastered it to the best of my ability um and uh that's that's really the core for me um same going yeah. off from there i like i think we got a wii so i got like um some gamecube games um so i had um i had like the the i think it's the gems collection um yeah and yeah. so that i got to try some of the game gear stuff and whatever else is on there. Um, I got the PC demo for Sonic Adventure DX. And I'd never played a 3D platformer before. (laughs) And it blew my (laughs) mind. 
<laughs> I memorized every single Emerald location in all of Sun- Knuckles' demo stages. His demo stage. So I could play that in like 30 seconds, like blind, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so uh, after that, of course, I tracked down a full copy of Adven- of uh, Adventure DX, and uh, I've played a ton of that. That's one of my favorite games. Um, then I went and got SA2, of course, and that was even better. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, re- and then after that, I think um, I finally got to try a game as it was coming out, which it was like 2007. I got uh, Secret Rings, and Unlike anybody else, I was too stubborn and too young to know it was bad. Um, <laughs> and I just I just ground through the first playthrough when it's terrible and you don't have a good move set yet. Yeah. And then after you get them after you play the it's that game is ridiculous because the base settings make the game bad. Yeah. But if you are on like level two and three of the skill tree, it it feels a lot better. It's pretty responsive and bouncy and you have some skills that can kind of smooth out the parts you don't like. Um, and it's pretty good. Um, so I played through that game and I, I upgraded my skills and I've got like over a hundred hours of secret rings time. (laughs) Um, and after that, I've just kind of, at that point I was, seriously in for the long haul with Sonic. So I'm kind of like, okay, I'll just kind of go through the games as I go and as, as they come out. So yeah, that's kind of how I got there. Awesome. The one funny thing is before, cause as I said, I never played games before um, Sonic. I didn't really know anything about games. Um, and I, but I, for some reason, I'd heard of Sonic the Hedgehog somewhere, um, but I thought his name was Sega the Hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know. So when my brother was showing me something, I, I was like, wait, I thought his name was Sega. Who's Sonic? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's pretty much synonymous with Sonic, so, or with Sega, yeah. so, you know. I guess that works. Yeah. I mean, he's the same color as the logo and everything. (laughs) (laughs) Well, before we wrap it up, uh, do you got any plugs? Anything you want to talk about you're working on right now? Plans for the future, aside from what we've obviously already discussed? Where can people find you online? All that happy stuff. Let's see. Um, Most of my personal projects are kind of on the back burner right now. Um, A lot of planning, so I probably shouldn't plug that yet. Um, Of course, working on the comics. Um, You can find me at uh, spiritsonic at twitter.com. And I am doing commissions. um, And for probably the rest of the summer, I'll be uh, opening commissions at the beginning of every month. So check early in May. Um, to see if you if you'd like to get um some work from me, that would be a great place to do it. I'm I'm tempted. You do. I'm tempted. I'm always <laughs> I'm always tempted. <laughs> though. I'm always tempted though. Get get a, get them while they're hot, because my dad keeps telling me I need to raise my prices. <laughs> okay, calm down, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a little bit. <laughs> I mean, he's probably not wrong though. <laughs> I think everybody needs to raise their commission prices, but at the same time, I'm like, wait, I, I mean, wait, <laughs> <laughs> wait. <laughs> I see. I will. I will take. I will take rare Sonic novels in 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 lieu of of payment on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I actually I had a, like a a Sonic novel, a weird like kids novel based on Sad AM when I was a kid. I have, yeah, that's I, what that's what I want. <laughs> I don't know where it is. I don't know what happened to it, and I don't know like w- why I had it and where it came from, and I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> so, I'm, oh, I'm, oh here, here's a here's a fun tidbit I can give. Um, okay, that related to rare Sonic novelizations. One of the stories I'm doing for 2021 is inspired by a, a classic British sonic novelization. Oh. Really? So keep your eye out and see if you can figure out which one. Ooh. Yeah. Well, heck, that's a tease. That's a good tease right there. 
Yeah. I think that's a good one to end everybody's on. Everybody's tearing through their old library going, where is that book? I know I have that book. <laughs> it's, re- it's really loose. It's not like I, I didn't really rip off anything by the end of it. So, yeah. All right. Thank you, Evan, so mm-hmm. much for joining us on the show. Good luck to you on the book. I don't know why I'm saying that because we're working together. I know what's <laughs> happening. but <laughs> We better have good luck on the book. <laughs> yeah. You better. <laughs> Uh, thank you for joining us and everyone uh, again check her out at Spirit Sonic get some commissions while you can because you know we're all locked indoors and we gotta do something yes yeah. and check out her Ghost of the Future comic as well oh yeah read my fan comic yes <laughs> at your own risk <laughs> Where can it's they very, find it's that? It's very good. Oh, you can find my my fan comic and a lot of my other fan art um, on my DA, which is evanstanley.deviantart.com. There you have it. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, joining us, Evan. Mm-hmm. All right, let's go ahead and get into some Q&A. If you want to ask questions to the Bumblecast, you can email us at bumblecast at yahoo.com. You can also ask your questions on Twitter at Bumblecast. Uh, You can also ask questions via Ko-fi at uh, ko-fi.com slash Bumblecast. Down in the YouTube comments below this episode, if you're listening on YouTube, or via Patreon comments and messages, or in the Q&A channel on the uh, Patreon Discord. Uh, there We do have a few ground rules that we've laid for questions uh, if it's been answered in the last few episodes or is on the FAQ over at BumbleKing.com is about, or is about past Sonic plans that will be covered in Lost Hedgehog Tales, we likely won't answer it on the show. If your question hasn't been answered in a while, check those places to see if uh, it might already be answered. So first up. We have the priority Q&A from our lovely patrons over at patreon.com slash bumblecast. First up, we got one from Diane W. During the Iron Dominion saga, most specifically the Journey to the East arc in Sonic Universe, uh, SBO was revealed to be a member of the Shinobi clan and may or may not be in relation to the clan's leader, the Bride of Constant Vigil. Was this particular backstory for SBO a personal headcanon of yours that you integrated into the comics, or is your headcanon for SBO's backstory something else entirely? Um, given my position with everything, I'm not sure where you draw the line between headcanon and unused plans. I was, I'm wondering if she means maybe like it was something that um, you came up with or Sega came up with something like that uh, um everything with the various brides and houses that was all me um and the intention was that constant vigil was his mother i mean they, it we got per, as close to hinting at it at, at it as hmm, let me try that again we got as close to hinting at it as we could uh this was around the time that sega was starting to to pay a little more attention to things and lock down things a little harder. So the established parental figures like Jules and Bernie and all of them, we could use, but we had to make sure not to refer to them as Sonic's dad or whatever. So since I had kind of learned that's how you have to be sneaky, sneaky with it. I set up constant vigil as SBO's mother and through just the hierarchy, of the way that the Shinobi clan did things, and again, sneaky, sneaky with the dialogue, we could pretty heavily imply it without ever actually saying it. Therefore, it never got rejected because we never had to get it approved. <laughs> ah, yes. Writing for licensors. I like it. Very good. Very good indeed. All right, here comes one from Crooker. Did Jar take any design cues from Robot Master Aesthetics? I know he had the arm cannon as Metal 2.0 way back when, but the way his limbs were drawn always looked very Mega Man to me. Uh, It wasn't really necessarily a direction on my end. Um, I believe Sam Maxwell did the original design, and I don't know where the 
design came from with that was stipulated in the script or if that was just something Sam did to necessitate what the script called for it had so well before my time. I don't know. Uh, we just kept it along when we rebooted shard and yeah, you know, just to make him different from metal Sonic, we kept the multi-tool kind of mega buster on there because why not? <laughs> I mean, the Mega Man aesthetic really mixes well with Sonic anyway, so it kind of makes sense. They both they both have that sort of cartoony aspect to them, so. Mm-hmm. All right, and our last priority question comes from Andrew D. Are there any plans for Cosmo the Mighty Martian after number five? I just finished it, and I need more. Also, does Super Duck exist in the same world as the older series, or is it an alternate future? <coughs> Uh, as far as I know, there's no immediate plans for a kind of Cosmo Volume 3, but uh, there weren't any immediate plans for a Volume 2. And the uh, response to Volume 1, uh, the award that it won, that helped a lot. So if you want to see a Volume 3, um, Cosmo the Super Martian or whatever we'll call it, uh, make sure you let Archie know. You know, directly email them, write them, uh, tweet them, because they pay attention to that sort of thing. And hopefully the Volume 2 run did as well, if not better, than Volume 1, because I certainly have plans for what I want to do with Cosmo and the crew. Uh, doubly so, because I want to see Tracy and Matt Herms do their magic on that series, because Kyle... I may have written a decent script, but what they did with it art wise is just phenomenal. If you have not read Cosmo, you know, even if you don't want to wade through my words, get it just for the visuals. They're both Tracy and Matt knock it out of the park. Yeah, both volume one and two are, are gorgeous. So Tra- <laughs> Tracy's designs are just fantastic. And uh, you can learn more about him, too, because we uh, actually interviewed him when Cosmo, uh, when the first volume of Cosmo dropped. So if you want to go back and listen to an older Bumblecast with uh, with Tracy, we talk about sort of him coming up with designs and all that fun stuff. So be sure to go check I mean, that I, out, too. Hey. <laughs> I told the man to make a spaceship that looked like salad tongs, and he did it. So... <laughs> Uh, as for Super Duck, uh, treat it as its own incarnation of Super Duck. It's inspired by the old material, which I am surprised how many people seem to even be aware of classic Super Duck. So uh, this is inspired by the old stuff. This is its own thing, though. Alrighty. And with that, let's go ahead and jump on over into the uh, standard Q&A. Got this one here from Toon Man. Toon Man, come together with your tunes. Save me. (laughs) I don't know. Every time I see that name, that's just what comes to my head. Anyway, I was just curious and was wondering if you're able to elaborate or not. And sorry if this seems like an old topic. Why was Infinite's backstory not explored a bit more in his mini-comic for Sonic Forces? More so than just he wants to see the world burn. Well, to me it seemed at least. Were you not able to tell more of his story because you weren't given enough info, or was told not to tell too much just in case it may have contradicted the game, or needed to follow some guidelines, or also might have been there where you were limited to four pages? Uh, As far as I'm aware, that is Infinite's backstory. That is the entirety of his motivation. Um, The Sonic Forces digital comics were unique in that Sega provided me with the plot lines. And I wrote the script off of that. It was very different than the regular Sonic books. Um, More or less, I was kind of adding dialogue and Uh, figuring out the pacing, because Sega provided the story. There was very, very little wiggle room. So, as far as I can tell, what we got in that digital comic is it. That is Infinite's entire breadth and depth. 
All right. And our next question comes from Tick Tick. Why would anyone who fought the Deadly Six before send a robot to fight the Deadly Six? Well, what else are you going to do if you don't have anything but robots? Yeah, what I are mean... What going to do, throw a chair at them? Well, I mean, maybe. It might be more effective. I mean, I could say, well, if Eggman activated you know, some kind of automated turrets in the cockpit, one, why would he have... Co- guns in this cockpit two that's because it's eggman he would totally do that three the deadly six would still take over the guns and then instead of a deadly robot you've got just guns going bang 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 and that's the end of the story so <laughs> see, that's why i introduced the deadly six at the tail end of the metal virus saga because the arc itself the the, the menace of the plague had reached its apex there's not much more you could really do with it narratively it was just bad so how do you make it worse to raise the stakes and the deadly six for all their faults are unique in that they can turn the central threat of the franchise on its head they can turn the you know, main force of the Eggman empire against Eggman and still use it against Sonic. So when you apply that to hordes of shambling robot zombies, it makes things really, really bad. So that's one of the scenes that I was really looking forward to as we were plotting it out was, you know, Eggman trying to rely on metal Sonic speed to just take Zavok out before things could take a turn for the worse and nope can't do it doesn't work that way all right and our final question this episode comes to us courtesy of pc the unicorn so ian dr wiley want to rule the world but exactly what would a world ruled by dr willie be like exactly unlike eggman who? who wants to that's what it says dr willie (laughs) <laughs> unlike Eggman who wants to rule the world due to him believing the planet can be improved with his machines Willie seems to just want to be recognized for his genius so would a world ruled by Dr. Willie be a terrible place to live in <laughs> I'm just reading the question I know I know and I'm not laughing at the typo so much as I'm laughing at the Mega Man 8 voiceover yes. of Dr. Light and applying that. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Wiwi Dr. is already pretty bad, but if it's Dr. Wiwi. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Wiwi. Dr. Wiwi. <laughs> what was that Dr. Wiwi and all his evil woobits? <laughs> Dr. Wiwi. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Be very, very quiet. I'm hunting Wiwis. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> 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 I, I'm so, I'm, 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 we're not laughing at you, PC the Unicorn. We're we're laughing with you. Oh, insta karma on my part. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Good thing this is the last one because I think I am about done. Yeah. <laughs> um. So in this nightmare scenario where Wiley takes over and does impose his will upon the world. I see it as a not as nice version of the Reploid future. Now, let me specify before the uh, virus took hold and Sigma went bananas and all of that. Because yeah, it seems yes. the implications are that the Reploid future of 20XDX was pretty nice until things went into the uh, mega crapper. <laughs> and in that world, you have man and machine living side by side. Under Dr. Wiley, I imagine that once he had conquered the world, his ego would have more or less been sated. So his focus would be on his true passion, which is building and experimenting with robotics. So he would just be churning out oddball robot master or even Reploid, since he was able to complete zero on his own, presumably, uh, and just keep churning them out and throwing them out into society and not really caring what it would do. I'm not saying that it would be a ideal 
world or that it would function particularly well. Dr. Light's vision, I think, was working out far better for everyone else. Again, before that pesky virus. But who invented that virus? Now, hmm. So I see it as a technically functioning but not too pleasant world where robots are coexisting with people most likely as kind of a superior class, presuming that the jump from robot master to reploid level of um, consciousness was maintained. Right. All righty. With that, <clears throat> that is this episode of the Bumblegast wrapped up. Anything else we need to add, Ian, other than our usual shout-outs and plugs at the end and uh, everything? Uh, just another thank you to Evan Stanley for joining us for this episode and giving us some insight into who she is and what she's got planned. And a thank you again to everyone who sucked with the show during my hiatus. Um, I'm still recovering, as you can tell. But thank you for your support and for showing Kyle all the love and just being with us during these very interesting times <laughs> sure that's one way of putting it <laughs> before we go we gotta give a big shout out and thanks to all the people on patreon.com slash bumblecast who help make this show possible through their monthly contributions big thank you to daniel h alex p connell t salute your cat crooker blue title gamer koopaling crew andrew d chris a john b diane w james k jennifer r revan the light lisa m preston m pc the unicorn frederick Tigama f wow justin s papa Dreepopolis, silly string tucaro scruffy met lee hk overthinking films don b john m chavel Mike B, Duiz Dizdin, Samuel P, Justin G, uh, Sin Fritz, Dave M, Sam Cybercat, and Final Neil. Kyle, where can all the wonderful people find you after the show is over? You can head on over to Twitter at KyleJCRB. You can find me there tweeting about video game music and other random stuff. Uh, you can also head on over to KNGI.org where you can find archived episodes of The Bumblecast and my other show, Nitro Game Injection, which streams live on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. It's a show all about uh, remixed video game music and uh, all sorts of other game music related stuff because, you know, that's my thing. I like video game music. It's fun. It's a good time. You should tune in there and listen to it. And, uh, of course, there's also the uh, 24-7 streaming radio over there as well, KNGI.org. Check it out, the KNGI Network. What about you, Ian? You can follow me on Twitter at Ian Flynn BKC. Go to my personal website, BumbleKing.com. That has a release schedule for all the comics coming out, which presently are none because of things. <sighs> But my portfolio, my whole body of work, all that happy jazz. And check out my original series with another Sonic alumni, Adam Bryce Thomas. It's their original webcomic called Drogoon. That's D-R-O-G-U-N-E. Uh, it's a fantasy, science fantasy series. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff coming around the corner pretty soon on it. We're only 30 pages old, so it's free. Get over there, read up on it, and if you want to help us out, head over to patreon.com backslash Drogoon and throw a dollar our way. You can get some free monthly gift art directly from Adam. Ooh. It's very nice. It's very good. You should go you should go read it. Go read it! What are you doing? Go read it. And also, head on over to Twitter at Bumblecast, and uh, you can also email us at bumblecast at yahoo.com. And you can, of course, listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and, of course, YouTube, and also over at the KNGI Network on KNGI.org. You can further support the show by going over to the Bumble Store. That's shop.spreadshirt.com backslash Bumble Store. We've got a whole bunch of various designs that you can on, put on various objects. And, Kyle, I'm half tempted to do some kind of Metal Ian thing <laughs> the Bumble Store. Why not? Give the folks what they deserve. More options. If you want it, let us know. We can put it together. Do it. Do it. Do it. Anyway, speaking of things you should do, 
go check out twitch.tv slash bumblecast gaming our uh, live stream channel where i've been streaming a lot of things throughout the weeks uh you can head on over there we definitely stream on sundays at 10 p.m eastern time uh you can also sometimes find me streaming on wednesdays and fridays also at around 10 p.m eastern time and uh you know maybe some other surprise bonus streams throughout the week who knows we'll see keep an eye on twitter for announcements and if i can finally get my breathing back under control i might start streaming again finally finished death stranding (laughs) at long freaking last yay (laughs) no promises though because as you can tell it's about time for me to tap out so thank y'all for listening to the bumblecast we'll see you in a couple weeks for episode 117 Be good. Take care. Be safe. Toodles. (laughs) See you guys later. I made it through the show, though. That's That's good. (laughs) That's a benchmark. Yes. There we go. Now we're recording. I should have started that sooner. (coughs) Whatever. Nobody will notice. Okay. Don't say anything. Okay, good. I'm glad we're on the same page. (laughs) <laughs> oh man you've been listening to the bumblecast a co-production of bumble king comics and the kngi network original theme music composed by ken coda snyder remixed intro by t lopes find out more information along with podcast feeder links mp3 downloads and more at bumbleking.com and kngi.org Good thing I only did six questions (laughs) instead of the full eight. Uh, I might have been able to get through those last two, but those last two would have been a little slower in (laughs) (laughs) very breathy delivery. (laughs) Yes, yes. Go, go rest. Go rest up. Don't. don't. I'm gonna go take my medicine. I'm gonna be good boy. Thank you again, Evan. <laughs> don't waste your don't waste your voice on us. Uh, <laughs> on me. I've missed it though. It's good to be back on the stage. It is good to have you back. It's just not a it's just not a proper bumblecast without some Ian. We need we need the uh, Ian. We need the Ian. <laughs>